On the other side, if by a law you would raise your silver money, and make four crowns, or twenties, in silver, equal to a guinea, at which rate I suppose it was first coined, so that by your law a guinea should pass but for twenties. The same inconveniency would follow, for then strangers would bring in silver and carry away your gold, which was to be had here at a lower rate than anywhere else. If you say, that this inconvenience is not to be feared, for that as soon as people found, that gold began to grow scarce, or that it was more worth than the law set upon it, they would not then part with it at the statute rate, as we see the broad pieces that were coined in King James the first time for twenties. Nobody will now part with under twenty threes, or more, according to the market value. This I grant is true, and it does plainly confess the foolishness of making a law, which cannot produce the effect it is made for, as indeed it will not, when you would raise the price of silver, in respect of gold, above its natural market value, for then, as we see in our gold, the price of it will raise itself. But on the other side, if you should by a law set the value of gold above its par, then people would be bound to receive it at that high rate, and so part with their silver at an undervalue. But supposing, that having a mind to raise your silver in respect of gold, you make a law to do it, what comes of that? If your law prevail, only this, that, as much as you raise silver, you debase gold, for they are in the condition of two things, put in opposite scales, as much as the one rises the other falls, and then your gold will be carried away with so much clear loss to the kingdom, as you raise silver and debase gold by your law, below their natural value. If you raise gold in proportion to silver, the same effect follows. I say, raise silver in respect of gold, and gold in proportion to silver. For when you would raise the value of money, fancy what you will, it is but in respect of something you would change it for and is done only when you can make a less quantity of the metal, which your money is made of, change for a greater quantity of that thing which you would raise it to, the effect indeed, and ill consequence of raising either of these two metals, in respect of the other, is more easily observed, and sooner found in raising gold than silver coin, because your accounts being kept, and your reckonings all made in pounds, shillings, and pence, which are denominations of silver coins, or numbers of them, if gold be made current at a rate above the free and market value of those two metals, every one will easily perceive the inconvenience. But there being a law for it, you cannot refuse the gold in payment for so much, and all the money, or bullion people will carry beyond sea from you, will be in silver, and the money, or bullion, brought in, will be any gold. And just the same will happen, when your silver is raised and gold debased in respect of one another, beyond their true and natural proportion, natural proportion or value I call that respective rate they find, anywhere, without the prescription of law, for then silver will be that which is brought in, and gold will be carried out, and that still with loss to the kingdom, answerable to the overvalue set by the law. Only as soon as the mischief is felt, people will, do what you can, raise the gold to its natural value. For your accounts and bargains being made in the denomination of silver money, if, when gold is raised above its proportion, by the law, you cannot refuse it in payment, as if the law should make a guinea current at twenty twos. 6d, you are bound to take it at that rate in payment. But if the law should make guineas current at twenties, he that has them is not bound to pay them away at that rate, but may keep them if he pleases, or get more for them if he can, yet, from such a law, one of these things will follow. Either, first, the law forces them to go at twenties. And then being found passing at that rate, foreigners make their advantage of it, or, tudely, people keep them up, and will not part with them at the legal rate, understanding them really to be worth more, and then all your gold lies dead, and is of no more use to trade, than if it were all gone out of the kingdom, or, threedly, it passes for more than the law allows, and then your law signifies nothing, and had been better let alone. Which way soever it succeeds, it proves either prejudicial, or ineffectual. If the design of your law takes place, the kingdom loses by it, if the inconvenience be felt and avoided, your law is eluded. Money is the measure of commerce, and of the rate of everything, and therefore, ought to be kept, as all other measures, 
as steady and invariable as may be, but this cannot be, if your money be made of two metals, whose proportion, and, consequently, whose price, constantly varies in respect of one another. Silver, for many reasons, is the fittest of all metals to be this measure, and therefore generally made use of for money, but then it is very unfit and inconvenient that gold, or any other metal, should be made current, legal money, at a standing, settled rate. This is to set a rate upon the varying value of things by law, which justly cannot be done, and is, as I have showed, as far as it prevails, a constant damage and prejudice to the country, where it is practiced. Suppose fifteen to one be now the exact par between gold and silver, what law can make it lasting, and establish it so, that next year, or twenty years hence, this shall be the just value of gold to silver, and that one ounce of gold shall be just worth fifteen ounces of silver, neither more or less. It is possible, the East India trade sweeping away great sums of gold, may make it scarcer in Europe, perhaps the Guinea trade, and mines of Peru, affording it in greater abundance, may make it more plentiful, and so its value, in respect of silver, come on the one side to be as sixteen, or, on the other, as fourteen to one, and can any law you shall make alter this proportion here, when it is so everywhere else, round about you, if your law set it at fifteen, when it is at the free market rate, in the neighboring countries, as sixteen to one, will they not send hither their silver to fetch away your gold, at one sixteen last to you, or if you will keep its rate to silver as fifteen to one, when in Holland, France, and Spain, its market value is but fourteen, will they not send hither their gold, and fetch away your silver, at one fifteen loss to you. This is unavoidable. If you will make money of both gold and silver, at the same time, and set rates upon them by law, in respect of one another, what then, will you be ready to say, would you have gold kept out of England, or, being here, would you have it useless to trade, and must there be no money made of it? I answer. Quite the contrary. It is fit the kingdom should make use of the treasure it has. It is necessary your gold should be coined, and have the king's stamp upon it, to secure men in receiving it, that there is so much gold in each piece. But it is not necessary that it should have a fixed value set on it, by public authority, it is not convenient that it should, in its varying proportion, have a settled price. Let gold, as other commodities, find its own rate. And when, by the king's image and description, it carries with it a public assurance of its weight and fineness, the gold money, so coined, will never fail to pass at the known market rates, as readily as any other species of your money. Twenty guineas, though designed at first for two hundred and one, go now as current for two hundred and eleven, tens, as any other money, and sometimes for more, as the rate varies, the value or price, of anything being only the respective estimate it bears to some other, which it comes in competition with, can only be known by the quantity of the one, which will exchange for a certain quantity of the other. There being no two things in nature, whose proportion and use does not vary, it is impossible to set a standing, regular price between them. The growing plenty, or scarcity, if either in the market, whereby I mean the ordinary place, where they are to be had in traffic, or the real use, or changing fashion of the place, bringing either of them more into demand than formerly, presently varies the respective value of any two things. You will as fruitlessly endeavor to keep two different things steadily at the same price one with another, as to keep two things in an equilibrium, where their varying weights depend on different causes. Put a piece of sponge in one scale, and an exact counterpoise of silver in the other, you will be mightily mistaken if you imagine that because they are today equal, they shall always remain so. The weight of the sponge varying with every change of moisture in the air, the silver, in the opposite scale, will sometimes rise, and sometimes fall. This is just the state of silver and gold, in regard of their mutual value. Their proportion, or use, may, nay, constantly does vary, and with it their price. For, being estimated one, in reference to the other, they are, as it were, put in opposite scales, and as the one rises the other falls, and so on the contrary. Farthings, made of a baser metal, may on this account too deserve your consideration. For whatsoever coin you make current above the intrinsic value, 
will always be damage to the public, whoever get by it, but of this I shall not, at present, enter into a more particular inquiry, only this I will confidently affirm, that it is the interest of every country, that all the current money of it should be of one and the same metal, that the several species should be of the same alloy, and none of a baser mixture, and that the standard, once thus settled, should be inviolably and immutably kept to perpetuity. For, whenever that is altered, upon what pretense soever, the public will lose by it. Since then it will neither bring us in more money, bullion, or trade, nor keep what we have here, nor hinder our weighty money, of what denomination soever, from being melted. To what purpose should the kingdom be at the charge of coining all our money anew? For I do not suppose anybody can propose, that we should have two sorts of money, at the same time, one heavier, and the other lighter, as it comes from the mint, that is very absurd to imagine. So that if all your old money must be coined over again, it will indeed be some advantage, and that a very considerable one, to the officers of the mint, for they being allowed threes. 6d. It should be 16 pence half penny, for the coinage of every pound troy, which is very near 5.5%. If our money be 6 millions, and must be coined all over again, it will cost the nation to the mint 330,000 pounds. 130,000 pounds, if the clipped money must escape, because it is already as light as your new standard. Do you not own? that this design of new coinage is just of the nature of clipping. This business of money and coinage is by some men, and amongst them some very ingenious persons, thought a great mystery, and very hard to be understood. Not that truly in itself it is so, but because interested people, that treat of it, wrap up the secret, they make it advantage of, in a mystical, obscure, and unintelligible way of talking, which men, from a preconceived opinion of the difficulty of the subject, taking for sense, in a matter not easy to be penetrated, but by the men of art, let pass for current, without examination. Whereas, would they look into those discourses, and inquire what meaning their words have, they would find, for the most part, either their positions to be false, their deductions to be wrong, or, which often happens, their words to have no distinct meaning at all. Where none of these be, that their plain, true, honest sense, would prove very easy and intelligible, if expressed in ordinary and direct language. That this is so, I shall show, by examining a printed sheet on this subject, entitled, Remarks on a Paper Given into the Lords, etc. Rem. It is certain, that what place soever will give most for silver by weight, it will thither be carried and sold, and if of the money which now passes in England, there can be fives. 5d. The ounce given for standard silver at the mint, when but fives. 4d. Of the very same can be given elsewhere for it, it will certainly be brought to the mint, and when coined, cannot be sold, having one penny over value set upon it by the ounce, for the same that other plate may be bought for, so will be left unmelted. At least it will be the interest of any exporter to buy plate to send out, before money, whereas now it is his interest to buy money to send out before plate. Aunts, the author would do well to make it intelligible, how, of the money that now passes in England of the mint can be given fives. 5d. The ounce for standard silver, when but fives. 4d. Of the same money can be given elsewhere for it. Next how it has one penny over value set upon it by the ounce, so that, when coined, it cannot be sold. This, to an ordinary reader, looks very mysterious, and, I fear, is so, as either signifying nothing at all, or nothing that will hold. For, I ask, who it is at the mint, that can give fives? 5d. The ounce for standard silver, when nobody else can give above fives? 4d. Is it the king? or is it the master worker, or any of the officers, for to give fives? 5d. For what will yield but fives? 4d. To anybody else, is to give one sixty-fifth part more than it is worth, for so much everything is worth, as it will yield. And I do not see how this can turn to account to the king, or be borne by anybody else. I ask, how a penny over value can be set upon it by the ounce, so that it cannot be sold? This is so mysterious, 
that I think it near impossible for an equal quantity of standard silver will always be just worth an equal quantity of standard silver and it is utterly impossible to make 64 parts of standard silver equal to, or worth, 65 parts of the same standard silver, which is meant by setting a penny over value upon it by the ounce, if that has any meaning at all. Indeed, by the workmanship of it. 64 ounces of standard silver may be made not only worth 65 ounces, but 70 or 80. But the coinage, which is all the workmanship here, being paid for by a tax, I do not see how that can be reckoned at all, or if it be, it must raise every fives. 4d. Coin to above fives. 5d. If I carry 64 ounces of standard silver in bullion to the mint to be coined. Shall I not have just 64 ounces back again for it in coin? And if so, can these 64 ounces of coin standard silver be possibly made worth 65 ounces of the same standard silver uncoined, when they cost me no more, and I can, for barely going to the mint, have 64 ounces of standard silver in bullion turned into coin? Cheapness of coinage in England, where it costs nothing, will indeed make money be sooner brought to the mint than anywhere else, because there I have the convenience of having it made into money for nothing, but this will no more keep it in England than if it were perfect bullion, nor will it hinder it from being melted down, because it cost no more in coin than in bullion, and this equally, whether your pieces of the same denomination be lighter, heavier, or just as they were before. This being explained, it will be easy to see, whether the other things said in the same paragraph be true or false and particularly, whether it will be the interest of every exporter to buy plate to send out before money. Rem. It is only barely asserted, that if silver be raised at the mint, that it will rise elsewhere above it, but can never be known till it be dried. Answ. The author tells us, in the last paragraph, that silver, that is worth but fives. 2d. Per ounce at the mint, is worth fives. 4d. Elsewhere. This how true, or what inconvenience it hath, I will not here examine, but, be the inconvenience of it what it will, this raising the money he proposes as a remedy, and to those who, say, upon raising our money, silver will rise too, he makes this answer, that it can never be known whether it will or no, till it be tried. To which I reply, that it may be known as certainly without trial, as it can, that two pieces of silver that weighed equally yesterday, will weigh equally again tomorrow in the same scales. There is silver, says our author, whereof an ounce, one, e, 480 grains, will change for fives, 4d, one, e, 496 grains, of our standard silver coined. Tomorrow you coin your money lighter, so that then fives, 4d will have but 472 grains of coin standard silver in it. Can it not then be known, without trial, whether the ounce of silver, which today will change for 496 grains of standard silver coined, will change tomorrow but for 472 grains of the same standard silver coined? Or can anyone imagine that 480 grains of the same silver, which today are worth 496 grains of our coined silver, will tomorrow be worth but 472 grains of the same silver, a little differently coined. He that can have a doubt about this till it be tried, may as well demand a trial to be made, to prove, that the same thing is equiponderant, or equivalent to itself. For I think it is as clear, that 472 grains of silver are equiponderant to 496 grains of silver, as that an ounce of silver that is today worth 496 grains of standard silver, should tomorrow be worth but 472 grains of the same standard silver, all circumstances remaining the same, but the different weight of the pieces stamped, which is that our author asserts, when he says, that it is only barely asserted, etc. What has been said to this, may serve also for an answer to the next paragraph, only I desire it may be taken notice of, that the author seems to insinuate, that silver goes not in England, as in foreign parts, by weight, which is a very dangerous, as well as false position, and which, if allowed, 
may let into our mint what corruption and debasing of our money one pleases, Rem, that our trade hath heretofore furnished us with an overplus, brought home in gold and silver, it is true, but that we bring home from any place more goods that we now export to it, I do not conceive to be so, and more goods might be sent to those parts, but by reason of the great value of silver in this part of the world, more money is to be got by exporting silver, than by any other thing that can be sent, and that is the reason of it, and for its being melted down, and sent out, because it is so heavy, is not by their paper denied. Ants that we bring home from any place more goods than we now export, the author tells us, he doth not conceive. Would he had told us a reason for his conceit, but since the money of any country is not presently to be changed, upon any private man's groundless conceit, I suppose this argument will not be of much weight with many men. I make bold to call it a groundless conceit, for if the author please to remember, the great sums of money are carried every year to the East Indies, for which we bring home consumable commodities, though I must own it pays us again with advantage, or if he will examine, how much only two commodities, wholly consumed here, cost us yearly in money, I mean canary wine and currants, more than we pay for, with goods exported to the canaries and Zant, besides the overbalance of trade upon us in several other places, he will have little reason to say, he doth not conceive we bring home from any place more goods than we now export to it. As to what he says concerning the melting down and exporting our money, because it is heavy, if by heavy he means, because our crown pieces, and the rest of our species of money in proportion, are twenty-three or twenty-four grains heavier than he would have them coined, this whoever grants it, I deny, upon grounds, which, I suppose, when examined, will be found clear and evident.